With us today is Veronica. Hey, Inertia. We're going to be talking about unwanted barking, leash reactivity. I have a feeling today we're going to get into some controversial politics in the dog world. There is no controversy in the dog world. Have you guys gotten a Furbo yet? Furbo is today's sponsor, and it's a product that we have genuinely, I mean this, we have genuinely used for years and years now. Furbo is a dog camera that allows you to interact with your dog no matter where you are. You can talk to them. It's HD video. You can toss treats to them. The latest version of the Furbo is the Furbo Perfected. It's almost unrecognizable now. It's like iPhone 1 versus iPhone 14. You can turn the camera around 360 degrees now. You can also subscribe to Dog Nanny. This is really what separates Furbo. Sometimes, guess what? You get busy and you don't remember to check in on your dog. And that's where this artificial intelligence comes in with Dog Nanny. It will actually notify you on your smartphone. That's a lot of Furbo alerts. It says she's crying, so I'm gonna check it. When your dog is barking, if they're eating or drinking, which they may not always be supposed to do. Furbo can detect a person in your house. Furbo can detect emergencies. There's so much that Furbo can do. You're gonna take my job away. I love the Furbo. All of this is really good for training too. So she was barking for a second, but then she resettled. It can be very useful to know if your dog is making noise when you're not at home. Okay. How many of you live in an apartment? You guys need a furbo. Okay, we got to get into the video here. Bottom line, if you ever leave your dog alone, you'll really appreciate having it around. We'll have a link below. All of your crazy and pretty unusual questions have been pouring in, so we're going to answer them. What is the most difficult behavior case you've ever taken on? That's a hard question. Part of my process when working with a dog is who is this dog that I'm working with? What are their capabilities? What do they like? What don't they like? What are they cut out for? What are they not cut out for? I can think of some tough cases that we've had on YouTube over the years. So can I. Remember the golden retriever? Pretty hyper today, but no surprise. We expected that. I caught a lot of heat. That was a leash training session because he was out of control. It was like 98 degrees. And he didn't know it. I sure did because I'm drenched in sweat the whole time. In the end, you didn't make that much progress that day. A lot of balance trainers have used this to come at me online too. They'll show clips of this dog pulling me all over the place. I think they missed the point of that video. And the point of that video is, yeah, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you don't get instant results. And when you're not willing to sacrifice the long-term well-being of a dog in order to get results, then, you know, this is sometimes what training looks like. Not everyone likes to show their struggles on the internet. <laughs> Well, I mean, look, if we're not going to show realism, what are we going to show? We're just going to show, look how good a dog trainer I am. I mean, dog training is one of the most ego-based professions out there. It's kind of put in the category of magicians or all-star athletes who are really gifted at something. And dog training is not like that. Sure, certain people are more talented because they put more time into it or they're more interested in it. When you look at dog training the way that we do, it is a scientific profession. We try to remember that at all times when we're working with dogs. But to name names, the Golden Retriever was a difficult day. Lafitte. Oh, the tree attacking dog. Yeah. We got there and we were like, okay, take us for a walk. Show us your dog attacking the tree. Let's see how bad this really is. Whatever I was expecting, it was not for that dog to just fully attack every tree he saw. He goes right after it. I mean, my goodness. Definitely an outlier dog training appointment. Do you remember Chloe, the rescue dog? Whenever you show up to an animal rescue place and say, hey, I want to train a dog, give me a tough case, they are happy to do so. What are you biting my shoe for? It's my shoe. I was afraid that she might play bite you into the ER on that day. You were I, concerned, I know. Yeah, I your stiff arm with the leash and holding her away from you was really good. It wasn't malicious biting, but it was puppy biting that had gone unchecked. With that adult strength, it made it really challenging to work with her. More recently, you guys will remember Chop. 15 minutes ago, I was ready to quit being a dog trainer forever. We did a whole series with Chop. He was really challenging mainly because he was extremely strong. He sees dogs. He is like, I've got to get to them. Jeez. He was completely untrained when I got him and he'd been living outside. Not just outside, but like on the streets with, you right. know, very yeah. little structure or direction in his life. He had no idea how to live in a human world. But in all of those cases, I was like, all right, what does it take to motivate the dog to at least get some traction? Do they like toys? Do they 
like treats? Do they like the environment? How can I reinforce events that I wish to see repeated? That's always what I'm asking myself. Even though dog training is a science, the nuances from dog to dog are quite different. So you really have to cater to the individual dog in the same way that you would a person. When we label a dog hard to train, to me, that's more of a red flag that we don't necessarily understand where that dog's strengths or weaknesses are yet. We haven't gotten to know the dog. Even in the case where a dog may have a learning disability or even mental illness, it's logical to assume that some dogs do have that. You as their teacher can calibrate to that and hold them to a standard that is acceptable for that individual dog. We'll see it all too often online. Someone will slap a choke chain on a dog and be like, ah, oh, look at that. They don't pull now because I just strangled them at the neck for a few seconds or popped a leash or, or added pressure if we want to be diplomatic. And you know, that's not getting to know the dog. And I think that is very risky. We can't just train without quality of life in mind. And that's not just you saying that. There's a lot uh, of science to back that up so far. I don't want to be on the wrong side of science. I really don't. That is not a good place to be. What is the toughest experience you've ever had overcoming a behavior issue or not overcoming it? Maybe you're currently struggling with it. My dog barks all the time at what seems like nothing. Well, dogs don't bark at nothing. Unwanted barking, I mean, yeah, it's a thing. Virtually all dogs will go through a barking phase at some point in their life. Has your dog ever gone through a barking phase? Are they currently an excessive barker? Do you like the fact that your dog barks to let you know, for example, when someone is at the door? It's really easy to get annoyed with barking, especially when it's really excessive. I think a lot of us really get in the habit of dismissing those vocalizations as being meaningless. But remember, dogs can't speak words. They have only so many ways they can express what's going on inside of them. Do your best to understand that there is a reason behind your dog's vocalizing and address the cause of the dog's barking rather than just trying to suppress the symptom, whatever it is they're trying to say. If you have a dog who's excessively barking, ask yourself, are you inadvertently reinforcing the barking? I don't know, maybe your dog's barking because it's dinner time and they want food and you're like, okay, okay, just be quiet. Here's your food. That is teaching them how to ask for their food by barking, right? And so in that case, you would either want to feed them sooner before the barking occurs or wait for a significant period of silence, maybe in the beginning, just a few seconds, and then feed them. Barking itself can be reinforcing, I think, to some dogs. Like when they have pent up energy and they're just like, bark, bark, bark. Which is why the number one way to resolve unwanted barking, you guessed it, exercise early in the day. Anecdotally, we have actually dealt with this ourselves recently. Whenever the sun goes down, <laughs> My little dog seems disturbed, or barks at least. It feels like she's saying, what's going on? The world disappeared. <laughs> I don't know if it's the darkness that makes her bark, or if it's reflections in the window that suddenly appear that weren't there before, or if it's lights outside. There's something about that shift from daylight to dusk. Yeah that makes Veronica want to bark. Even though I don't fully understand what she's barking at, I'm not just like, be quiet, stop barking. I try to let her know, that's okay, that's normal. That happens every day. Thanks for letting me know. Notice how cautious Brie is being as to claiming why the barking is occurring. I think that's important whenever we're analyzing anything with our dogs. Even though I don't know for sure why she's barking, I can still validate that emotion. I can still say, you're barking at something. It must be strange. It's okay though, don't worry. That's normal. It's all right, it happens every day. <laughs> I don't want her to feel like I don't hear her when she's trying to say something to me, even though I don't speak dog. And so I think acknowledging her barking before I just ask her to be quiet is the way to go. What does your dog bark at? Because some of us don't understand what our dog is barking at. We took our dog to the vet for a bath and now he's petrified to enter a bathroom with running water. Even when vets and groomers are really careful and they really in a good faith way try to get a dog comfortable with a bath, the fact that there's a time limit. They have to get it done. You're paying them to get it done. Unfortunately, this is probably quite common because of that. Any time that I've watched you try to get a dog comfortable with a bath or anything similar, Mm -hmm. when they're uncomfortable, your effort is almost completely focused on 
breaking the process down so that you can really specifically identify the exact point where a dog gets uncomfortable. See how she's not taking treats? That's a sign that she's a little anxious and maybe I should just take a step back. It sounds like they have correlated their dog getting really nervous when they hear running water. Yes. Makes sense. So stop the running water. Yeah, maybe fill up the tub when your dog's not present. Then it's a matter of really counter conditioning them that is reversing their current emotional state and trying to create a more optimistic emotional state in the presence of that water. And that's great, but I do understand it's not always that simple. I mean, I filmed my first several baths with inertia, and even though inertia is perfect in the bath, she hears me talking about inertia is perfect in the bath. She doesn't like them though. She doesn't enjoy them. I know. We're you not gonna take a bath. We're not gonna take a bath, sweet girl. She just put herself in her crate. This Aww. is what she does when I when I say take a bath. She's but, never had what I would consider a bad bath experience. It seems like she's like, can we just get this over with? So if your dog is super scared, break it down into smaller steps. In the meantime, there are doggy wipes you can use, a sponge bath. Yeah. There are things you can do to sort of keep them as hygienic as possible. And be tolerant. Understand most dogs don't enjoy getting a bath. What does your dog think about taking a bath? You know there's dogs out there that are like, I can't wait for this. It's another thing we're doing. Yeah. I love dogs like that. And tell me how you taught that so that I can get some tips. What do you do when a dog is not very motivated by food or toys? It's almost a bad question, and here's why. All dogs, assuming they're healthy, must eat. So to say that they're not motivated by food is disingenuous. What most people mean when they say this is, my dog won't take a treat in a particular context. They're in the middle of a reaction towards another dog or they're barking at something out of the window and they won't take a treat. That's different than a dog not being motivated by a treat. They're not motivated by a treat in that particular instance and you're likely trying to take a step that is too big by saying, hey, just try this, you should like this. You don't get to determine what motivates your dog in a given context. That's why we always break things down into smaller steps versus trying to do damage control when they're well over threshold. And that's the thing, virtually all dogs are not going to take treats when they're over threshold, when they're overstimulated. And so our job is to manage them and not put them in that situation until they're ready for it. And that's a steady progression that we take our time on, which we've demonstrated many times on this channel. When many people ask this question, it means they have not yet gotten proficient at identifying their dog's threshold levels yet. If your dog isn't motivated by food, then you're likely asking them to perform a certain way when they're over that threshold. And that's not where your training efforts need to go. That's your cue. I put my dog in a situation where they're not receptive so much to learning what I want to teach them right now. And I need to find easier versions of this. Now, as far as toys go, that's a little bit of a different story. There are definitely a good amount of dogs out there who are not motivated by toys, but more dogs are motivated by toys than one probably realizes. So often when people try to introduce a toy to a dog, they're just like, throw it at them or toss it and like, hey, do you like this? Do you like that? They're not really trying to get their dog engaged. When I introduce a toy to a dog, tug of war is what I usually go for. So I'll just jiggle that toy, I'll move it around like a little squirrel. And you see how she perks up when I did that. Whereas if I was just like, hey, here. I see so many people, they'll get their dog excited about a toy and then they just, nip that excitement in the bud by being like, now sit before I throw it. Meet your dog halfway and play some of the game they want to play too, instead of just insisting they play the game you want to play. In the beginning, you want that excitement, even if it's sloppy and they're jumping all over you. Right. And you got to throw it. Don't, don't hold them to a standard. Great point. Can you train two puppies in the same house with two different people training each dog? There's a couple of ways to answer this question. Number one, can two people focus on training their project, their dog or puppy, while the other person focuses on training theirs. Yeah, one person per dog, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I guess you could do that, why not? Can two people successfully train one dog without confusing them though? It's a good idea to be on the same page. Where you run into trouble is where you have competing philosophies of how to teach this dog. You really wanna make sure that you both take agency in the dog's well-being long-term and that you're really focused on long-term results and not short-term results. I would caution anyone from getting two dogs at one time. That's not something that I think I would do, though life is long, you never know. But even as a professional trainer, I, I wouldn't welcome that because it feels like two dogs are about four times the work. For those of you who have multiple dogs and multiple people in your household, how do you approach that? 
Do you have one main trainer or is everyone supposed to train equally? Do you care about consistency or does everyone have their own way of working with the dog? This is good data for us. We both try to work with both dogs. We try to be on the same page. Yep. And But even in spite of that, we still have differences from time to time. You saw recently, Brie loves using the bungee leash. Are you trying to or, be provocative? Is that provocative? That's provocative to dog Why? I with. still use it. And yeah, and it seems to be working out okay. So maybe we are on the same page. Why does the leash trigger my dog to have an outburst towards other dogs? The reason a lot of dogs will start barking and lunging when on leash versus not being on leash is because it's very restrictive. It can be very frustrating. This is the thought. Our dogs need to be on leash in a lot of situations. So as someone, hey, Hi, cutie. <laughs> okay, we have dogs now. One of the things that I've done to combat leash reactivity in my own dogs, including inertia, is to really prioritize free walks on a long lead. They can behave a bit more naturally. They can pace back and forth, go ahead a few feet, stop, smell something on the ground, now run back. It gives them a lot more freedom to interact with the world. It should occur in a place where there aren't a lot of dogs. You can always drive to a park, some old ball field. There's a lot of ways to let your dog roam and smell. For those of you who are lucky enough to live in a more rural area. Yes. Slow traffic dirt roads are some of my favorite places sure. to walk reactive dogs because it's naturally wide. It's wide enough for a car. So you have all that space and visibility to really keep your eye out for animals and other dogs. So just be understanding of the fact that a leash is restrictive to a dog and that can cause frustration and it takes time to teach them how to adjust to that. I think this goes without saying, but on leash greetings, especially for a dog who's reactive, not a good idea. I don't do on leash greetings. It seems like there's a decent percentage of people that are dealing with their dog barking and lunging while on leash specifically. Is that something you guys have dealt with? Let me know in the comments. Hi from Sweden. Sweden is well known as one of, if not probably the most progressive country when it comes to the treatment of dogs. Crates are illegal here. Right. So okay. are prong collars and e-collars. I don't like prong collars or e-collars, again, because they approach behavior from the outside in rather than truly motivating a dog how to behave. And the science indicates strongly that there are long-term welfare concerns when using those types of training methods. So what are your thoughts on the fact that all three of these things are illegal? Is it equivalent? That's interesting. We yeah. use crates. Yeah, I use crates. I frequently show people how to use crates, yet I am very much against the other things, but they're all kind of put into that illegal category. So, I mean, what's going on here? Am I behind the times? Maybe. Maybe crates are tomorrow's shock collars. I think it is easier to neglect a dog when you have a dog-proof box to put them in, but are they inherently bad or neglected? It feels like there is no way to use a prong collar or an e-collar except as intended, except as an aversive. But when a right. crate is used as intended, it's a safe box for your dog. I suspect the reason it's illegal is because of misuse of the crate and putting dogs in there for an extended period of time and neglecting them because dogs are very active animals in general. They need to be able to walk and run and they can't spend too many hours a day in a crate without their quality of life really being reduced. The way that we use crates are kind of as a bedroom for a dog. I always use an oversized crate so they have plenty of room. I mean, inertia right now, the door is wide open. Well, yeah, you saw her well. let herself into that crate <laughs> when she wanted comfort, in fact, because we let her know that she was not gonna have to take a bath and she chose to go in there. So I'd say in inertia's case, yeah. That's her happy place. That's where she goes when she wants to feel comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I don't ever have to force her into a crate or anything like that. Crates are not good for all dogs. There are some dogs who just do not do well in a crate. And for those dogs, we shouldn't use crates. But the fact is that, at least as I see it, it's important to be able to control our dog's environment at times. Uh, if someone's at the door, for example, and I don't want my dog jumping on them, I can say, go to your crate. Now I'm going to go answer the door. So they're controlled for a few minutes until everything dies down and I can let them out. So I don't fully understand the logic behind making crates illegal. I certainly personally, this is an opinion, wouldn't put them in the category of choke chains or prong collars or electric collars. I do think that those are more harmful than not for dogs dogs, especially since we know that positive reinforcement training has been shown time after time to give us fantastic results, probably quicker results, at least as fast. That's what the science says. Do you guys know of any studies on crates out there? I'm curious because I'm aware of a fair amount of science that indicates that aversive tools like prong and e-collars are not advisable in pretty much any circumstance with a dog, but I'm not aware of 
science around crates, and it could just be that I'm not aware of it, so please let me know. But it seems as though the motivation behind the law is to increase the quality of life for dogs. I can always appreciate that. For those of you who live in countries where crates aren't common, do you miss them? Do you agree with this idea that the crates should be illegal, and if so, why? Is it to make sure that the lowest common denominator are people who misuse them don't have that opportunity? Or is it because you think there's something inherently wrong with uh, using a crate to control your dog's environment. What are your thoughts on the term owner and parent, etc.? I don't like the term owner, and the reason I don't like the term owner as it relates to having a dog, it doesn't really describe the relationship accurately. I'm an owner of my car, I'm an owner of the chair that I'm sitting on, I own the computer, but those aren't people. <laughs> Do yeah. you know what I mean? But these days, I, I think we're starting to settle on the word guardian. I think that encapsulates what it means to have a dog. So that's the term that I use. I am my dog's guardian. How do you guys call yourselves as the caretakers of your pet? Do you have a word? Do you say parent? Someone says, hey, I'm my dog's owner. It's not like I think, oh gosh, they're a terrible person or whatever, because that, that's what we say in society. I just don't think it's the most accurate word we could use. I mean, legally, technically, I believe it's accurate. Yeah. As of now, dogs are classified as property True. and not as persons. Although, for those of you who are interested, let's talk about personhood for dogs in the comments too. Mm, Tell me what you think. Interesting. If you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe we'll make another video about it someday. Ahead of your time. Did you guys enjoy this video? Should I, should I never make a video like this again? Or do you want to see more of these? Your feedback means everything to us. Get a Furbo. And I'll have a link below. I think it's going to make life a lot easier for you. Dog Nanny will change your life. It's pretty awesome. You can follow us on social. I think I'm giving up Be Real. I am still not giving up on TikTok, even though none of you go to my TikTok. That's okay. Follow us on TikTok. I Guys, mean, if you want. Dog Talk is a mess. Let's take it back. Dog Talk is take a mess. Take back Dog Talk. Dude, I am telling you, the most toxic dog training I've ever seen is on TikTok. It'd be great if we could turn the tide, but I think the algorithm really likes that controversial stuff. So, what you know, whatever. Well, the only thing that can change the algorithm is you guys. Get a copy of both of Zach's books. Also available in German. Dear Miss Hunde Trainer of YouTube. I think it means number one subscribe dog trainer on YouTube. Thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe. You know what to do. Tell your friends about us. Take back dog talk. Bye. See you in the next video.